Um, I will start by saying just a few words about our studio in Berlin and the exhibition that we put together that this piece was originally a part of. And the, uh, yeah, the studio is called Weisse Sieben and it's uh, an artist run space where we, we, use, well, we use it for occasional exhibitions, quite many workshops and mainly for our own working space when we are in Berlin. All of us travel a lot and I'm mostly based in Stockholm as well. So. Uh, I guess I'm the one that is the least there. Uh, it's uh, yeah, between me and uh, Julian Oliver, Danja Vasiliev, uh, Gordo Savic, who was here as well and um, who I did this piece with, um, Brandon Howell and Servando, Servando Barrero. Um, <coughs> and for last year's Transmediale, uh, the artistic director of Transmediale, Christopher Gansing, asked us to put together a group show uh, at the Labor Gallery in Haus de Kultur und der Welt. Um, so then we, we proposed uh, an exhibition with 10 pieces, um, all relating to, well, most of them at least, relating to uh, the technological world that we depend so much upon now, the vulnerabilities of it and the possibilities of exploit and um, <coughs> also uh, propositions or uh, speculative propositions of how to solve those problems with uh, the world that we're building. Um, and for this um, exhibition we made uh, a catalogue which is uh, well, it's really the 11th piece, piece in, a, in a sense. Uh, we made a hundred of these, these books, hand-bound, cloth cover, uh, but uh, it's not um, a regular book. You just have a few pages of print. Um, and then you have a cutout hole with a circuit board. Uh, and this is a little Linux computer that when you open the book, um, it will boot and it will share a wireless network. And in order to read the book, you will need to um, join that network and uh, it will capture you and direct you to the content of the book. Unfortunately, I don't have a book with me, but I thought I'd just use the the content of the of the book to to uh, to say a few words about the the rest of the pieces in the exhibition as well. Um, and I think I, I will. I mean, I will, I don't want to be very long, so uh, I will not talk about all of them. But um, um, this piece, for example, is uh, called the Transparency Grenade by Julian Oliver. Um, it is, well, in the, in the age of uh, uh, Wiki leaks and Snowden and so on, it's a, a device for uh, making it easy to leak. Um, it's a hand grenade where you, when you pull the sprint, it will record all the information that it sees, both sound and wireless traffic and what people print on printers on the network and so on, and, and automatically leak it to a website and publish it. So <laughs> in a meeting, if like your employer is doing bad things or you're part of a bad government organization, you just bring this thing and pull the plug. It's not so discreet, so <laughs> you might not want to be caught with it. Uh, but of course, it's quite conceptual. Uh, Julian also made uh, an Android app that does exactly the same thing and also made the infrastructure for uh, publishing this information online. But he, uh, and also yeah, provides all the, all the source code for that, but he's not hosting that service himself. So, um, and so far, I, I don't know if somebody actually uh, caught on and, and uh, deployed it for real. Um, this is a piece by um, Brandon Howell, which is a, yeah, the infinite, yeah, and the word which is almost impossible to pronounce, contemporary <laughs> device. Um, it uses the Firehose feed from Twitter, which is like everything anyone writes <coughs> on Twitter. So it's like a huge amount of data that always keeps flooding on the screen. Um, or rather, when it, I mean, it always keeps flooding from the fire, this Firehose interface. And the mouse has a scroll wheel. So you're meant to sit on the mouse and scroll the wheel, and you can scroll forward. Uh, and the purpose is to try to keep up in time to be ahead of the stream and see the newest news. And it's impossible. I mean, it's really 
there's so much information coming from all people writing, so you need to work really hard to be um, in the current time. Um, this is a piece that I made called the Tempest Radio. Um, during the Cold War, Tempest was a code name for uh, yeah, both for protection against and for, uh, for intelligence using uh, compromising, compromising emissions from devices. Any, any electronic device, any signal, uh, any transition of current from on to off would uh, generate a burst of electromagnetic energy emanating from a device. So any signal that goes through a cable would also be, in some sense, a radio transmitter. Um, and there was, like during the 70s and 80s and 90s, there was a lot of rumors about this thing that uh, you could uh, reconstruct the images of the computer screen far away or what was sent to a printer or through a cable. And then in the early 2000s, there were a bunch of papers declassified, both from NSA and MI5, documenting that this was actually done. Uh, that from a distance of about a mile, you could reconstruct the screen on a computer. Uh, on a computer, so you could like eavesdrop, and some uh, methods were very simple. Like uh, in the age of CRT screens, uh, you could use a photo detector that is very fast. And even if you just like, if there's a computer inside a room that has a window, uh, the light in the room will flicker as each pixel is updated on the screen. So you could actually very simply then just from the light reconstruct the image as well. Uh, me and uh, Gordo and uh, uh, Martin House, we did a couple of experiments with uh, taking computer keyboards and reconstructing the keys uh, you write on them from old PC uh, keyboards. Now, we didn't try at a far distance, but at the meter it was no problem to be able to uh, receive the, this um, compromising emanations and, uh, uh, well, basically it means that you could use you could take a PC keyboard, connect a battery to it, and use it as a wireless keyboard. <laughs> um, what this radio does is that it, um, it, it cancels every intentional transmission and only uh, listens to involuntary transmissions. Um, and yeah, mostly on, on sharp transitions like di digital, um, from digital systems. Uh, any square wave would have um, specific harmonics, it would have overtones, and uh, this radio would only tune into signals that have corresponding overtones of, of square waves. So with it you can, you can put the device on the antenna and you can tune to find uh, uh, signals or information that leaks uh, from the device and listen to it. Um, Ferns here by uh, Julian Oliver. Um, is a re yeah a reappropriation of the um, uh, the old TV sets that cannot receive any signals anymore. There are no analog uh, TV transmitters in most of Europe, as far as I know, especially not in in Germany. So these devices are completely useless. They have nothing to listen to. So he instead he uh, changed this device to put uh, a Wi-Fi scanner that takes all the pictures that goes through the uh, through the radio waves and it will show anything that it finds. So if you're close to this one and surf, you will, all the pictures you surf on will also show up on the TV. So you could look at your neighbors surfing, you could just see the pictures, but... Um, let me see. Uh, Netless by Daniel Vasiliev um, is a um, proposed communication device or covert communication device for situations where you cannot trust the um, like telephone networks or uh, internet networks. Um, the idea is that you put a Wi-Fi base station on trams in the city and uh, as the, uh, the trams uh, go around the city you can drop stuff in, the, uh, in this Wi-Fi router and you can pick up stuff. So it becomes an, an anonymous uh, sort of sneaker net where um, the container of information has a geographical location and it's only, yeah, the information can only be um, changed by the people who are near to it, but nobody knows who was connecting to it. You cannot track the, the traffic. Um, so, um, 
paketbrukare den. Uh, it's a device that uh, replicates the uh, um, electromagnetic signature of one place and uh, invades another space with uh, that electromagnetic signature. Um, it works in um, in the Wi-Fi bands, but it, I mean the the idea uh, was originally more about um, yeah. It, it, Moving one space to another, shifting shifting the space, so teleporter in a sense, but specifically in, uh, being invasive um, and having <coughs> having the presence of one space in another. Um, you see. So um, now this looks at specifically at Wi-Fi frequencies, um, and this yeah this is a United States frequency allocation map. This is the same thing for Europe. Uh, it goes from like, very low frequencies, three, 3 kilohertz to 30 gigahertz. Um, one little block around here is uh, the Wi-Fi network, uh, the networks, which is called the ISM band, Industrial Scientific Medical. And this is the one little spot that was left for, like, for, for all of us to play around with. Uh, everything else is like government or industry. Um, <coughs> and these this little slice over here um, oh, is in turn then divided in 14 uh, Wi-Fi channels, which, which are overlapping. And many of them, um, you see, uh, not, not all of them are, are allowed in all countries. So it's, it's a bit different in different locations. But um, these 14 channels um, are represented by 14 routers that sits in this circle on top of the device. Each, each of these transmits on a specific <coughs> channel. And in Lyudmila we have a similar device, also with 14 routers. Each of them listen to uh, what is sent over there. And it is sent through the, the internet to this location. Um, the cables that are um, lighting up, uh, each of those uh, lit wires are uh, strapped around the network cable and they show the traffic in that cable. So each, and each cable go to, to one router. So it, it actually represents the, um, the traffic that is happening on one channel. <coughs> um, and the, yeah, an effect of, of this is that well, if you look on your phones, for example, you can see networks that don't belong here. Um, we have, well, we have the, the real-time link from Ludmilla, so we send uh, data from Lumila. So you will see networks called Lumila or Tina, for example. <laughs> um, and uh, every three minutes or so, we also shift to uh, playback recorded data from Seoul. So you would also see networks from Seoul. And the effect of this is that if you look up your location on your phone using the Wi-Fi networks, uh, then it will put you, your location in Ludmilla or potentially in the, um, the Modern Art Museum in Seoul. Um, and yeah, this, this works because uh, GPS, GPS doesn't work inside. You need to see satellites. So when you're inside, um, you get location through what networks you see. And then you, you need to be online as well. Um, your phone would send the, the network it sees to a service like Skyhook, for example and they build a database. And when you send stuff to them, you actually also contribute to, to their database. So in some sense, we also pollute their database by saying that these locations are, well, like Axioma will be sort of more likely to actually be inside Ludmilla after this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they, yeah, they make a prediction about the location and that is what is shown on your phone. Uh, but in, in yeah, it becomes a way of uh, uh, seeing the effect of this, yeah, the signature of one place being replicated in another. Um, so I thought I, I would just show a um, short video of um, Julian talking about um, the packet bricke as well. I could also say that uh, the name packet bricke, the packet is the like the atom of network communication. This, um, you send things over a network in unit of packets. And the, um, 
we did this originally in, in Berlin, uh, building the, the, a bridge between our studio, Weisse Sieben in Neukölln, and uh, Haus der Kultur in der Welt. Um, and relating to uh, Platz der Luftbrücke and uh, feeding uh, one then barren place with, uh, with data from another place. Um, there's not so many networks in, in Haus der Kultur in der Welt, which is in the middle of Tiergarten. So, um, I think Volker, you can think of it as both a network intervention and a geographical intervention in the sense that we are increasingly reliant on devices, often handheld, network capable devices, in order to understand um, our geographic environment, and many of the services and, and, and you might say infrastructural um, offerings of our, of our immediate environment. Now, what Packet Broker does is works with a sister node in Vice's even where our studio is, captures all of the network traffic. Um, all the beacon, beacon frames for a particular part of network traffic that wireless routers we depend upon and uh, re injects it into the RKV, into the space in Love or Berlin. But by doing that, it, it, it makes, a, um, it, it makes a, a very, very interesting um, intervention in that when one pulls up one's phone, you'll see all the different access points actually as they are being used in, in Vice's classes, even where our studio is right now. You, you will actually see those access points here in the RKV. Those access points don't physically exist in the RKV. Those wireless routers don't exist in the RKV. They're being, they're being, if you like, mirrored here in the space. The secondary effect of that is that when you actually use your phone in order to rely on, for instance, a local cafe or restaurant or maybe where's the nearest U-Bahn, your phone will be giving you the wrong information. In effect, it folds geographically Weiserstrasse or Bodenstrasse, and, and the whole Bodden Keats and the Schiller Keats where our studio is, folds it over the HKB, effectively producing a new imaginary um, topography. Each one of these uh, cables here actually represent real transfers happening right now at Mercurum, at our studio. So what you're actually seeing here is events represented that aren't happening here in the HKB. So Packet Broker is a very powerful intervention and also a signature work that exemplifies the danger of, of depending upon this kind of network mediated relationship to our environment. It's both an exploit and I, I think a very, very volatile reminder. Through this remediation produces an impossible reality. People, for instance, um, here at the HKB are, are going looking for cafes and restaurants outside the HKB that don't exist. Where do they exist? They exist around our studio. So, um, yes, <laughs> um, should I say a few words about, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so um, I will be um, staying at Ludmila for a couple of weeks to do uh, residency and then I will work with what was originally thought to be um, a sister product of the Tempest Radio, uh, which, uh, well, in, when I was Thinking about it first, I was uh, yeah, sketching the name Tempest Aura. Um, it is a device that would take sort of um, uh, aura photographies of um, um, devices, of the electromagnetic fields and uh, potential compromising information leaks around the device. Um, and I've already done a few experiments with this. It basically, it's a scanner with a surface that you can put the device on and it will slowly build an image that extends outside of the device uh, with uh, the electromagnetic uh, fields that are detected by a probe that moves underneath uh, uh, the surface that you put your device on. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so far the images looks uh, beautiful, I think. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Great.